Weiser, a Year 10 Journalism student at Christ College, Canterbury, and I'm investigating if cycling infrastructure around Christchurch is worth the money. To answer this question, I interviewed Christchurch City Councillor James Goff, who plays a big part in cycleways around Christchurch. I interviewed someone who has been biking to work for 10 years and someone who has driven to work for their whole life, what they think of the idea. Disclaimer. The AI voice you hear answering my questions is not Mr Goff's, though it is his words. What are the key benefits of investing in cycleways around Christchurch? Reduce traffic congestion by offering an alternative mode of transportation. Cycleways help alleviate traffic congestion on the roads. As more people opt for cycling, there are fewer cars on the streets, leading to smoother traffic flow and reduced delays for all road users. Improved air quality, increased cycling reduces the number of vehicles on the road, resulting in reduced emissions of pollutants such as greenhouse gases and air pollutants. This leads to better air quality and a healthier environment for residents. How have cycleways impacted the overall transportation system in Christchurch? Cycleways have had a significant impact on the overall transportation system in Christchurch. They have diversified the transportation options available to residents and visitors, providing a reliable and efficient alternative to car travel. By integrating cycleways into the city's infrastructure, Christchurch has created a more balanced transportation system that caters to the diverse needs of its population. Have there been any economic benefits associated with the development of cycleways, such as increased tourism or business opportunities? Yes. The development of cycleways in Christchurch has brought about economic benefits, including increased tourism and business opportunities. The presence of well-designed, connected cycleways attracts tourists who enjoy cycling as a recreational activity or prefer exploring the city on two wheels. This, in turn, can stimulate the local economy. Through increased spending on accommodation, dining, retail, and other related services. Additionally, the availability of cycleways can create new business opportunities, such as bike rental shops, bike tours, and cycling-related events. What are the key benefits of investing in cycling infrastructure? Safety improvements as well for the for the people that really do want to cycle, whatever the whatever the infrastructure is there. If you invest in the if you invest in a good infrastructure, then it it's really um, helping to protect those people on the roads. As well. What are like a really well connected cycling uh, infrastructure? Um, influence the quality of biking to work in your area? Yeah, I mean, there's, um, I've got pretty, I live in Opawa, and there's, there's mostly pretty good cycling routes, I mean, and it's really bumpy in the transitions between all the road and the cycleway, because they haven't done the, the curve and channel and the drainage very well, each of the, um, each of the road where it meets the cycle path. One of the barriers, um, is, probably unawareness of cyclists by other road users and drivers and um, it doesn't seem there's enough of a focus on um, educating drivers about how they can look after cyclists on the road. That's um, That's a big concern for a lot of cyclists and a lot of potential cyclists that, that they see people on the road that behave in a certain way and don't don't have the awareness of other road users that are really vulnerable. Um, so that's something that I've, I've seen for many years as a concern and been involved in accidents as a result of um, an unawareness of cyclists by, um, by drivers here. Have you ever considered cycling to work? And if not, what is that reason? People to work from my home than to drive to work. Uh, and secondly, the logistics of uh, preparing and dressing for work. So when I drive, I can shower at home in the morning and put on my suit. But if I cycle, 
I would need to take a suit with me and it could get crumpled and I would also need to have a shower at or close by work. There are logistical difficulties. If I need to take um, uh, extra goods with me, such as bags, extra computers, lots of paperwork, then it is difficult or impossible to do that on a bicycle. What are your thoughts on the current cycling infrastructure in your city or town and um, how do you think it's well maintained? Uh, the cycling infrastructure in the two towns which I spend most of my time in, which is Auckland and Christchurch, I would say that in Auckland, um, in the inner part of the city, is well developed and well maintained. In Christchurch, it is not yet developed. Um, some parts do have cycle lanes for short uh, distances, and they look very impressive, um, but much of the city is still not connected by cycle lanes. Are there any challenges or obstacles that you think prevent more people from cycling to work in your area? Yes, I think the absence of fully connected cycle lanes is one thing because that means there is a risk of uh, an accident with a motor vehicle when you are not in cycle lane. And secondly, I would say that it is the um, impracticality of carrying large loads with you on a bicycle, uh, which in some cases would be impossible. What would it take for you to um, switch from driving to cycling for your um, commute? Are there any... Um, specific improvements or changes in cycling infrastructure that would motivate you to do so? I would want to see a dedicated cycle lane uh, all of the way between my home and my workplace. Have you ever encountered any safety concerns or issues while driving alongside cyclists? cyclists and if so, how do you think these issues could be addressed? Yes, I have frequently seen dangerous behaviour by cyclists. Uh, the most common one is cyclists riding two or three abreast and blocking the path of motor vehicles behind them. Uh, that should, would, should be addressed by... Um, enforcement of the road code which prohibits cyclists uh, riding abreast in such a manner.
Hi, I'm Jake Bennett and I'm a student journalist at Christ College and my topic is basically why New Zealand students, why aren't they doing so well in the classroom? Hi, I'm Luke and I'm with Nicole Belante. I'm the assistant principal. My name is Jake and I'm a student journalist attending Christ College who has set out to find answers to the question that is crossing many parents' brains at the moment. That being, what is causing education to have no effect on some of our children in New Zealand? Relating to this topic, I decided to interview a teacher from a public school and a student from a private school so I could get the false perspective of a teacher, a student, a public school and a private school. First interviewed was the student who attended the private school. That's what he had to say. Honestly, I probably think that it has to do with uh, the school system and then how it's quite repetitive and then some people just can't be bothered doing it in public schools. How do you think schools can, what do you think schools can work on to make that less of an issue? Um, maybe make it a school more exciting. Instead of spending like your whole day in just one classroom, which can be quite repetitive, maybe you can do it spreading out like some private schools have done, which is probably why they've got better better rates of um, into university and finishing high school and stuff. And then maybe also, I don't know, just have more people, even if it's hard, to have more teachers to students as possible, try and get as much uh, involvement with them. I oh, yeah, had some good points. What about for Take Cross College, for example, how they're spending all their money and putting it into this big new fancy gym, do you think that they could put that money into something better to make students learn easier and better? Well, I think that the gym's quite a good idea because it kind of helps facilitate PE, which is quite important in, um, in Christ College, as well as sports, which is a big reason why Christ College is so popular. So, and I think Christ College's education is pretty good. It's one of the best in the country, probably. So, I don't think, I don't think we need much improvements. So basically what you're saying is that with PE, PE, like something outside of the classroom, is helping or will help with students being more academically um, responsive? Well, it could if... If you're having uh, better facilities, you could um, look forward to classes more, which means you probably could try try harder in certain classes leading up to PE, or then just, I don't know, have a better outlook on school, having a, a nice new facility. Then I arranged an interview with the head of the English department at Kaipoi High School, Ms Collins, so that I could get her point of view as a teacher and from the public school side, uh, here's what she had to say. So education in New Zealand is actually falling quite swiftly and it's quite concerning that we've got so many kids that are coming out functionally illiterate and innumerate, which means that they can't read and write or do maths at, to function effectively in society. Before they even get to high school? Well, before they get to high school is a big issue because... You know, but the, these ones, the school leavers that are, the, you know, one third are functionally illiterate and innumerate. So that's sixteen-year-olds. Yeah. So you know, you you're sending them out, and they've literally got so few skills to function in society, like filling out a form or getting a driver's license, passport, that sort of thing. Like, you actually need to be able to read and write and do basic maths. Is that at all schools across New Zealand, or? It's nationwide, but some schools don't have that level of statistics. Um, so it depends on wealth and area and stuff like that. There are differences there. What sort of areas would that be? So a lot of the Northland, Auckland areas do tend to have um, high levels of truancy and more kids living in poverty and that sort of thing. So they statistics do tend to be worse in our a lot of our assessments especially the new ones I feel kind of marginalize 
um, like Māori Pacifica kids or kids who don't have English as their first language um, and it kind of makes it a whole lot harder for them like they've got to do a whole lot more work to get to that same level so Makare Wallace talks about the first thousand days so that's effectively your first three years of life and if you are deprived in that time it's got way more impact than if you're deprived later in life so if you have if you don't get the right nutrition if you have like significant trauma um, if you don't have a lot of interactions with people around you you know like when you're learning language and that kind of thing so if you go to um, early childhood or to um, primary school and you don't have a lot of oral language yet you can't learn to read and write because you don't know the words no so you're already so far behind and then basically you've got kids playing catch up so that's one of the biggest issues that we're getting with literacy um, is that they're, they're coming to primary school they need so much work before they can get reading and writing and then yeah it just impacts all the way up the chain does that all fall back on childhood and how they've been brought up not all of it um that is a significant factor but if you know there's the issues with if you you know if you haven't had breakfast um or if you're living in a multi-family home or that kind of thing and you know you're not getting enough sleep and it's it's really hard to learn in those conditions so yeah the the first thousand days is big but you know if you if you carry on with the same kind of issues and stuff it, it's not going to get any better for you no is that public schools as well as private schools like how's that all coming together to the two schools so your public schools are more likely to see that sort of deprivation because your private schools people who are poor can't afford them so unless you get a scholarship or something like that um and if you've not been going to school enough or you know not succeeding enough you're not going to get a scholarship no so you you're far more likely in a private school to have success because you're already five or six steps ahead because you've got money in the family you've got um you're more likely to have parents in the home that are looking out for you and if they're putting that much money into your education they're going to be on your back to make sure actually on your teachers backs too to make sure that you succeed yeah um so yeah pri- private school education is more likely to lead to successful outcomes yeah but that's so much more than just the education yeah because this at private schools as well as public schools this distractions like phones and mates that can distract you from working in the classroom how does that all come together for learning yeah phones are my biggest bugbear just you know even if you you know i'm not looking at it i'm not looking at it but you know you're sitting doing your work and um, chat or something comes through and you get distracted and even if you go back to your work you've lost your train of thought so you don't have that momentum going and so you're sort of having to restart your brain each time that you look at your phone yeah um and mates i mean kids will be they'll muck around um you know you you've got to have some fun but again the the expectations at a private school are far more likely to sort of get you back on track a lot quicker and especially like a lot of them tend to be quiet or tend to use detentions and punishments and stuff like that um, a lot of the public schools use what's called restorative justice which sort of people see it as a lot softer um, and you have conversations about the behaviours and you're supposed to try and work out what the harm is and how to fix it and that kind of thing um, so there's not that instant right behaviour I'll give you a detention it's okay 
let's have a talk about this behaviour. And so it doesn't seem quite as strict, I guess. Like a behavioural learning programme sort of thing? Kind of, yeah. Yeah, yeah that kind of thing. Um, just to to get you back on track and to try and make sure that you keep that relationship with your teacher. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I mean, if, if you're determined not to succeed, doesn't matter what school you go to. And if you're determined to succeed, doesn't matter what school you go to. But say if you're falling back in classes or behaviourally you're falling back, the help provided by teachers and stuff, they'd be different at a public school compared to a private school, would it? Not necessarily. Um, you know, a lot of public schools have damn fine teachers and damn crappy ones too. Um, and I think probably there's more of a push at private schools to help kids succeed and to, to have those outcomes. So it's not necessarily the the ability to teach and help kids understand and stuff that it's more that we'll keep going until you succeed. And so there's a lot more help that can go in in a private school because there's more funding. So if you need somebody to do a bit of tutoring or something, it's there, it's easier. Whereas at a public school, it's, it's a lot harder to make that time and to, to get, get those connections happening. My name is Luke and I'm a Year 10 student at Christ College. I have chosen to investigate why Christ College should add cooking class to the curriculum. I have interviewed Miss Ballante and she will tell you why we should have it and why we don't have cooking class. Hi, I'm Luke and I'm with Nicole Ballante. I'm the Assistant Principal of Curriculum here at Christ College. And I'm asking a few questions about why we need cooking class at the school. Why don't we have a cooking class at the school? It quite simply comes down to the fact that we don't actually have the facility at present to run them. So you need actually a, a kitchen of a certain grade with certain safety features and we don't have the facilities right now. So even though we have a commercial kitchen with the dining hall, because that's a commercial kitchen and has certain health and safety regulations around it, we can't have students in there. So we actually don't have the building. It all comes down to that. Oh, okay. And how can cooking class help students develop important life skills? Oh, I think cooking classes could be really beneficial. I've been at school, other schools that do have them, and you look at nutrition. You also obviously look at some basic skills that would be helpful when you go out at university or flatting after school and I think it gives a really good foundation for things to build from in terms of learning how to fend for yourself. Mm. What would be an ideal setup for a cooking class that would best benefit the school's curriculum? So I mean I think one of the things that we're lucky with the diploma is how much flexibility we have in our timetable and how we can have either a two period or a four period and I think that would be a great setup to intro have introduction to it at that stage where you could have just little two period courses but then those that really saw this as potentially um, a passion could uh, pursue it at a four period course as well. NCA also has um, hospitality credits available and so you can actually have cooking right up until NCA level and you actually have to plan a whole menu and put on a dinner and all sorts of things and we could actually do that so I actually think there's lots of different ways that you could set up a class that would really help the curriculum. Well, how would it benefit the diploma? What would it well, I think part of the theory of the diploma is that we want our boys to be quite well-rounded and to have a range of skills. 
And I think in that regard, going back to your first question around what skills would it provide students, I think it would contribute to that all-rounded education and to life outside the gates. We have financial literacy for that exact reason. Mm -hmm. So it would be very much in the same vein that it would help to um, fill in some of the gaps around things that aren't necessarily taught, but we think would be really beneficial. Mm. How can the boys use cooking skills to benefit their future in terms of either health or work opportunities? Well, I think first and foremost, having an understanding of nutrition and how to cook things to retain their nutritional value is one of the things you do learn in a traditional cooking course. And that's going to be a natural benefit to any person that takes that sort of line of study. But I think more importantly, they're working in um, a kitchen professionally. So either being an apprentice chef, working your way up to being a head chef, that's actually a really exciting career path. And all you have to do is look at the the popularity of shows like My Kitchen Rules or MasterChef to show you that actually there's some really passionate chefs out there. And it's not a gendered thing. In fact, some of the best chefs in the world, some of the top chefs in the world are male. So there's no reason why it wouldn't fit into a boy's education because there's some really good pathways for boys um, career-wise, should they have a passion for food. I mean, let's say if it did get, where would it go? Sorry, can you repeat that question? Like, where would you put this, like, as the new gym's going in? Oh, right. If we had a space, where would we put it? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, down underneath the old gym would be a great spot if we could. Um, I also think you could, um, like, say where the nursery is, you could have some purpose-built kitchens, over there um ultimately it's the problem of you need the capital in the first place to build it and there's so many competing things when we also need new science block or a revamped science block i should say um our music blocks a bit tired so there's a lot of buildings that you know started in the 70s that need fixing so it's pretty hard to sell an addition when we've got ones that we currently have that need work on as well that's our big barrier yeah could cooking class provide a platform to contribute to positive mental and physical health oh absolutely i mean i think if you if you look at horror and think about that physical aspect and looking after yourself and feeding yourself well i mean it's something i really didn't learn when i was your age and it took me a long time to understand how to fuel myself properly and I think it's um, a core, a cornerstone of well-being is, is to understand how to do that. Mm. Like at home, I main don't know how to use the oven where I just rely on air fryers. Yeah. It's made stuff like that easier for us. Yeah. And, and I would agree with that. There's actually some ways that um, we can, we could teach you guys some stuff around some of those you know, microwaves and air fryers and all of that sort of stuff. But really to do it justice, we really want to teach you those skills about how to properly cook on a stovetop. What temperature is the right thing in a stove uh, or sorry, in an oven to cook different foods and, and get the best out of it? All those sorts of techniques would be really quite a cool foundation for you guys. Mm. What would be the best approach to engage the students in the cooking class? and make it enjoyable oh i think teenage boys and food go pretty hand in hand in terms of engagement um as a teacher i know that if i put food as an incentive for things it it, it's a pretty big motivator so it's just making sure that it's food that you guys actually want to learn about um there's no point teaching you how to make brussels sprouts we need to actually make you um things that you guys enjoy eating and and trying to find the healthy way to do that Mm. How can cooking class help to foster creativity and innovation in students? Mm. Well, I think going back to my example of something like My Kitchen Rules or um, or MasterChef, you can see right there how they're given creative tasks, right? You can say, these are your ingredients. What can you come up with it? And that's at the cornerstone of the hospitality achievement standards at NCA. They have to design their own menu and there has to be a creative approach to it. So 
I think understanding that it's not just following a recipe, that being able to use the information that we teach you at the basic level to then devise um, an individual recipe or a whole menu is, is a creative pursuit. Mm. How would that, though, find all the shifts around here, like teachers willing to teach for cooking class? Well, there are people that are trained specifically as food tech teachers, so we would have to recruit probably a new teacher mm-hmm. um, in order to do that. I think one of the other things is, of course, that we have a great community and there are people with good connections within our community that might be able to help us in the first instance with having sort of guest speakers, just how you would have a, a guest speaker in agribusiness that comes from the agriculture sector. You might have people that are connected through our families, et cetera, that have experience through hospitality that could help. Mm. What kind of benefits could a cooking class provide beyond the just the physical act of preparing food? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so I think beyond just learning how to prepare food, I think you're having to consider... Um, let me start let me start that thought again. I think beyond the act of just having to prepare food, you're really having to look at the way in which you're meeting the needs of somebody else. So you're actually having to think of others. And that's obviously something we we want to develop in you guys, that empathy, that understanding of of who who you're working with. So if you are being the chef, you actually need to think about who you're feeding, why you're feeding them, what's the context. And there's a lot of social thinking that has to go on into being a good cook. And Mm. I think that would be a really, a benefit that people might not really consider mostly. Yeah, last question. How can cooking class contribute to overall learning and develop the students in a boys' school? Mm. Um, so I think sort of it, that sort of sums up sort of some of the different points that we've made throughout this interview that really a cooking class at a boys school, A, breaks down some gender stereotypes. Mm-hmm. It shows boys that actually there's a place for them in the kitchen and there's also career paths for them in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. I think it also sets our, would set our students up for um, being good members of a of a you know their whatever flat they move into i think there's some really good benefits to setting them up for life skills um increasingly in our world because we don't have gender divide as much in the household you know you you've got mums that are working just as as much and as hard as the dads in in a in a um mum and dad household that you know, everyone contributing their equal share. And it would be lovely to think that we are producing young men that can that can be equal partners in a whatever family and relationship environment that they can they go into when they're older. Yeah. Thank you for your time, ma'am. Yeah, thank you, Luke. You're welcome. My name is Cameron and I'm investing, investigating the New Zealand Defence Force. The main four points I'll be focusing on are one, to find out what type of job it is, two, what the requirements are, three, what type of skill set you would need to join, and most importantly, four, to find out if it is overall a good career. Hi, my name is Cameron and I interviewed two people who have and are in the New Zealand Defence Force and asked them about how they found working for the Defence Force, if they found it difficult to get the job and what they enjoyed most about their job. The first person I interviewed was Logan Simpson, a recruiter based in Christchurch. Hi Logan, um, 
was it hard to get in? Um, I guess I wasn't sure at the time because I just went through the process like everyone else. Um, originally, I went try. I tried as a pilot, <clears throat> and that was really competitive, and I wasn't successful there. Yeah. And then joined um, as an aircraft maintainer instead. Yeah. Uh, how long have you been in your current position? So, in recruiting here, I've done two and a half years. In the Air Force, I've been in thirteen years. What do you enjoy most about your job? Yeah, I've had a lot of highlights. Uh, I do really enjoy the recruitment side. I enjoy um, being able to talk to like yourself and other students about what their career aspirations are. Um, and for me, it's, it's valuable too because you feel like you're making a difference to your own organisation, getting good people in. Um, other highlights I've probably had is, is going overseas and playing sport and representing the Air Force for that. And um, other highlights is, is probably operational deployments too. How much training did it require to work on aircraft? Yeah, good question. It was, uh, it was about four years once you started basic training to being fully qualified, um, got a qualification out of it. Um, and then for likes of going away with the Navy, that required another about two years of experience. Do you uh, think working for the Defence Force has like, given you more opportunities like as a New Zealand citizen? The only extra benefits that you have in the Defence Force uh, perhaps is, is around the free medical and dental in terms of um, any other perks that maybe other people don't get. There isn't really any, anything else. Uh, would you recommend your career to someone like me? Yeah, absolutely. I would. I'd recommend it for two different reasons. Um, I think it's it's widely accepted now that people go into careers and that's not necessarily their career f for for life. Um, and I'm in that, that same position, so I joined as an aircraft maintainer, but I already know my next steps isn't going to be an aircraft maintenance. So why I recommend it is the Air Force or the Defence Force in the whole gives... Um, people the opportunity to do some pretty out of the ordinary stuff and from that you build some really good skills as well that employers want. Yeah. Do you think New Zealand actually needs an Air Force or a, or, um, a Navy or Army? Yeah, it's a good question and um, you know with how much we spend on a Defence Force it's a worthy question too um, but ultimately <clears throat> yes I do and it, perhaps it's um, for a lot of reasons that you may have seen in the media recently, like sort of the flooding up on the east coast and being able to assist up there. Uh, previous to that, you know, we've had flooding down here locally in Ashburton and the west coast. Before that was the COVID response and looking after the managed isolation. Um, currently we've got troops over in the UK training Ukraine soldiers. Mm -hmm. Currently we've got aircraft overseas delivering humanitarian aid to like the Pacific Islands. And they also do the resupply to um, Antarctica for all the scientists down there. Um, New Zealand also has one of the biggest search and rescue zones in uh, the world. And so without an Air Force and a Navy patrolling that and making sure people are safe, um, yeah, who would be doing it, I guess? Yeah, that's pretty much all my questions. Next, I interviewed Sean Brown, who used to work for the Defence Force. What is your full name? Okay, Sean Keith Brown. Thank you, um, Sean. Uh, how old were you when you joined the Defence Careers? Uh, I joined in 1997 as a 20-year-old. Was it always something you wanted to do? Um, no, I hadn't really thought about it, to be honest. Um, the opportunity arose when a friend came out of the Air Force and sort of showed me the way around and uh, tickled my fancy, so I joined up as an engineer and, yeah. Mm. Uh, why did you choose the Air Force and not like the Army or the Navy? Uh, more about the technology of the items you'd be working on once you sort of got qualified. I was interested in aircraft. Hmm. Uh, did you think it was hard to get in? Uh, at the time, yeah, there was quite a process. I, I didn't have much of a preconceived idea of how hard it was to get in. Um, I was probably particularly more worried about the fitness levels versus the academic levels. Um, yeah. My academic skills were pretty good, so yeah, yeah we got it not too bad. Yeah. Do you think it would be easier nowadays or sort of still the same? 
uh, I think it would be easier nowadays. Uh, they're screaming out for good people. Yeah. Uh, what? So, how long were you in that um, engineer position? Like, um, I, yeah, I was an aircraft technician for about ten, eleven years, um, and then I was working as a civilian engineer for the Air Force through the MOD companies to work on their aircraft as a civilian. Yeah. Um, do you think um, working for the Defence Force had given you like more opportunities as a New Zealand citizen, like um, benefits? Yeah, very much so. Not, not so much benefits from a um, handout money side of things, but the training is that the military and especially the Air Force sort of gives its airmen a second to none worldwide. So whenever I've gone for jobs um, from trade level all the way up to management level, um, having that defence career background on the CV has always been a massive plus. Um, it de-risks you as a person from an employer standpoint because um, they always yeah. know they're going to get those attributes, those soft skills, you know, the hard work and good ethics yeah. and those from yeah. a defence person. Um, what type of person would you recommend your career to? Oh, interesting question. Yeah. Um, a person... I think um, the specialty that the Air Force gave me and what I saw um, would benefit any human being that wanted to do well. Um, they took people that weren't that good and made them good. They took people that were good and made them better. Um, but always the training finds your weaknesses and exploits them and makes you focus on them to grow as an individual. So the, the training and camaraderie that the defence gives you is literally second to none. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, w would you see working in the defence force as a lifetime career or like you could live off it at, like when you retire? Could you do it up to retirement? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's very comfortable. It's very secure. Um, it's very de-risk as a career op option. I don't think uh, the Air Force or military in general is something you'd go to if you wanted to be wealthy or, yeah. you know, uh, prosperous. But as far as lifestyle, family unit, um, and for your own family, if you had one at the time or, or you know, making a family during yeah. the career, it's very, very safe, very, very secure. Very fun. Um, there's good and bad points, obviously, with overseas service and the, the risk of war and having to be those first points of call. Yeah. Um, you're, you're always called out for floods and tornadoes and tidal waves and earthquakes and that sort of thing. So, but that's not a that's not a burden either. That was always a, a reward getting called out for the for the civilization. Mm. Uh, that's all my questions. Thank you. Oh wow, that was quick, mate. Yeah. Just to conclude, if you are interested in joining the Defence Force, I recommend visiting one of their recruitment offices or taking a look at their website at www.defencecareers.mail.nz and have a look at the opportunities available there. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Alicia and I'm a Year 10 boy at Christ College. My investigative journalism topic this year is about what aspects make Christ College expensive. Throughout my journey, I have interviewed Mr McFarlane, the Acting Director of Finance at Christ College, then followed by Mr Donaldson, the Acting Deputy Principal at Christ College, and then lastly followed by my parents, Andrew Smithson and then Louisa Viatoni to get their thoughts and opinions across from their side of the spectrum. What is the cause of the price increase each year? College historically has not made a profit. It's been supported by its foundation. Um, we're obligated to, to break even rather than run down our, our long-term investments. Not only that, each year obviously costs increase in terms of inflation. Um, a major component of our cost structure is um, staff costs and um, that goes up in accordance with um, various benchmarks uh, across the indus industry to ensure that we're retaining our, um, our excellent teaching staff. Mm. Um, in your own opinion, do you think that the, col the money the college receives is put to use well? Like, is it used well, like responsibly for the appropriate things? 
Absolutely, we're a, we're a registered charity and um, we're required to uh, reinvest in, in our own organisation and our boys. Um, our, our motto, each boy at his best, we, we, that's exactly what we focus on and we provide uh, not just the educational component but the co-curricular activities together with the pastoral care. <clears throat> and um, lastly, um, why, uh, just as a thought, why would you not reduce the price but allow more people in each year? Uh, it's a component uh, twofold, one of which is um, campus constraints, but they can be addressed. Uh, but chiefly it's the, the service offering that we provide. Uh, we aim for smaller class sizes and uh, each boy recognised as an individual and uh, educated accordingly. So my first question is, obviously, what is the cause of the price increase each year? So basically, obviously, inflation, but like, what's the main drive? Uh, I would say, you know, the inflation and the cost of living, cost of living index are the two things that go together. But then there's also um, other issues like salaries. So for example, um, if the uh, teachers for the state sector um, get an increase in their salaries, then the teachers' salaries across college will go up by the same amount. Mm. And um, that will mean that you will have greater costs. Yeah. Because as Mr. McFarlane may have explained, your biggest costs really are wages and salaries. Yeah, he um, showed me a PDF. Yes, okay. And um, my second question is, um, I was um, thinking, why another option we could have done is, why not reduce the price but allow more people into college each year? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so you could have more students across college, um, but the school has a limited capacity for the number of students it can take. Okay, because we've undertaken to keep the class sizes small, no more than 24. Mm -hmm. And also because of the restriction of some of our classrooms, we literally cannot, we probably couldn't fit more than 750 boys into the school. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of economies of scale, if you're interested in that side of things, you're suggesting that you know you have a lot more students here, but they pay less. Yes. That's a kind of like an economy of scale, I suppose. Mm. But actually, we're limited by how many boys we can actually fit into the school mm. for a start. So I don't think you'd be gaining much by cramming a whole lot more boys in the school because it would change the nature of the school and also could affect the quality of the teaching because mm. parents want their sons to be in relatively small classes so they can get better individual attention. They don't want their sons to be in classes like we get in some state school classrooms where they're 34, 36 students in the classroom. So you've got to be careful about pushing the numbers up for a start um, because it changes the nature of the school and the quality of the education. And secondly, um, you'd have to have a lot more students in order to be able to then um, reduce the um, fees. Mm -hmm. And last question, um, in your own opinion, do you think that college uses the money well that they receive? Well, I think it does because uh, we've been very, still recording? Cool. We've been very careful about our spending, um, certainly at least as far as I can remember, um, but certainly since Mr. Arrived in 2000, Mr. Wynn arrived in 2016, there's been a strong expectation from the board that we are very careful about our spending. So we don't, we, we look at everything we spend very carefully to make sure that we're not wasting money. Um, the, Mr. McFarlane's probably explained to you that the school is quite expensive to run because mm. of the high insurance premiums, Yeah. Um, because of the nature of our buildings. Um, certain things like uh, staff salaries, also to some degree things like um, infrastructure and repairs, um, cost of electricity, power, our power bills are 
uh, quite extensive. We had tried to reduce our power bills by being more careful with power usage, mm -hmm. but that's a big kind of given cost. So I'd say the school is pretty careful about what it spends and the board um, are mindful of the fact that um, we shouldn't be wasting money. So I'd say on the whole, I'd say we do watch our spending pretty carefully. Mm. Well, thanks for that. Okay. Um, so, as a parent, do you think that the price that college puts is a bit too high? Uh, my answer to that one actually is, is I'll qualify this answer. Um, the price, high or low, is relevant to the performance. Uh, what I mean by that is that if the price was set low and there were no performance, well, the price is still disproportionate. If the price was high but the performance was also high, then you're getting value for money. And so in this case, then the price itself is relevant to the academic performance we're seeing. And the answer then, is it too high? No, as long as we see academic performance. Okay, and um, second question. If you were asked, what price range would you select and why? Uh, well, that's actually a really hard question to answer. Um, price range. Well, again, it comes down to what you get for that spend. So in terms of... Um, a price range. I don't think there is such a thing as, as establishing what a price range might be. There is such a thing though as establishing what the maximum price that as a consumer we'd pay um, and of course that too is performance derived. So essentially we don't mind spending money on education if out of that we can see that you're getting an academic grounding and also you are a well-rounded student. Um, you know, and, and each of these things is, is quite a uh, hard set of, of conditions to put any kind of expectation on. Um, you know, what, what I mean by that is that, well, there's no such thing as a set number. You know, it's something that we assess and we see almost on a yearly basis. So, as a parent, do you think the price is too high? As a parent, I think education is priceless and you simply can't put a price on education and knowledge. As a parent, I think it's unfortunate that we feel we have to pay in order to give our sons a better education. Yes, I do think the price is high considering how much good could be done with that value. If you were asked, what price range would you select and why? I value Christ College very highly. If I were asked, I would say that the price range should be based and dependent on the education given and progress made by the student. Anyone can teach badly and the students not learn anything. It takes great teachers to teach well and to elevate each student to be the best and most educated that they can be. These teachers are priceless. To this end, I feel that Christ College fees are fair because the level of teaching is very high. My name is Locke Alexander and today I'm exploring the question, is our grid ready for an all electric future? Join me as I investigate this topic and discover how our grid will shape the future.
future. Join me as I investigate this topic and discover how our grid will shape the future. That is the sound of the Lake Coleridge power plant, one of New Zealand's oldest. There are more than 100 hydroelectric dams in the country that produce 57% of New Zealand's power. The balance is made up of 23% fossil fuel, 15% geothermal and 5.5% wind and solar. The power is shared one third residential, one third industrial and one third commercial. The New Zealand government is trying to limit spending but at the same time be as green as possible. So how much do we spend on keeping the grid running and upgrading our equipment? Nathan Green, Principal Communications Advisor at Transpower said in 2022 Transpower spent $220 million on capital and $173 million on the maintenance program. Programs to renew, refurbish and upgrade the grid for the full year to 20, June 2022 it was um, a capital expenditure was $220 million. Um, and our maintenance program was worth an additional 173 million. That expenditure is regulated by the Commerce Commission, and we're currently working on a proposal for the next uh, regulatory period, which is from 1st of April 2025 for five years. And for that, we're forecasting a one third increase in base capital and operating expenditure. Expanding the grid is one of the key ways to support electrification of a country. NZ Steel are switching to electric arc furnaces instead of coal, Fonterra's coal boilers are being converted to be electric, and more people than ever rely on electricity for transport, like here in Christchurch where 20% of Metro's bus fleets are EV. This all adds up to make an expected 70% increase in demand by 2050. Since this is so important, how difficult is it to expand our grid? Nathan Green says, that grid expansion can take up to eight years and cost tens of millions of dollars. There's a lot of new generation coming in. We do need to increase capacity um, to carry that electricity from where it's generated to where it's needed. So there's a huge amount of work going on to expanding our grid um, or, or increasing capacity in the grid. Now, it takes a lot of planning and years to implement you know, capacity upgrades. Um, you know, a new transmission line could take sort of eight years, cost tens of millions of dollars, and that involves extensive um, consultation with the local communities, with you know, with government, with local government, um, landowners, and so forth. Now, if you look at one of our major ma major capital works um, to facilitate the shift to electrification, um, was the Clutha Upper Upper Waitaki Lines project down in the South Island. Now, that's the first of, of many such works. Now. It, it put in place 900 kilometres of new conductor wire, 27,000 insulators, um, 300 pylons had been strengthened, nearby substations had to have the equipment upgraded. So this was to increase the ability to bring electricity from 
down on the bottom of the South Island northwards, and the total cost of all that work was two hundred million dollars. So we're so we're talking significant amounts of money. Um, so one of the things we're focused on is making sure that new generation is put in places where there's existing capacity, um, and we don't need to build new new, li new lines to them. Now, if you put a new solar farm a long way from any transmission equipment. We could facilitate that, but we would need to build transmission line to it, and that cost will be borne by the other the investor, not by us. I asked Extinction Rebellion activist Albie Moffat what he thought about grid expansion. Albie said that grid expansion conflicts with their tenth core value of decentralisation, and power should be consumed where it is produced. Well, uh, the national grid conflicts with our uh, tenth core value. Of decentralization you know power, power really should be consumed where it's generated a, a local network more like water sewage the grid is one of our most important resources and like all things crucial to the function of a nation it should get the recognition it deserves but does it so i asked people what they thought i think my power is too expensive well it's a very important part of our economy uh it, it, it's a driver for you, you know everything really you know from the wife's hair straighteners to uh, you know in the winter it's very handy uh, the pylons around the country a bit unsightly uh, but you know we do have uh, renewables you know so as a country we're, we're very fortunate there steep lots of rain temperate you know temperate uh, climate so uh, look but honestly I don't think much about it I just pay the power bill I also asked Nathan the same questions and he said that New Zealanders are used to getting electricity at the flick of a switch and a reliable electricity source only matters when it isn't there. It's a really good question and look I think you'll know New Zealanders are used to getting electricity at the flick of a switch and that means we can take it for granted um, and a good way of thinking about it is that a reliable electricity supply only matters when it's not there. Um, and so absolutely not people, I think, don't understand the work that goes on behind the scenes to keep the power flowing. There's a lot of moving parts, a lot of players. Um, and, you know, and as we saw in the Hawke's Bay recently, no infrastructure can be 100% reliable. And we worked really quickly to develop a bunch of workarounds because our, our infrastructure was pretty heavily damaged. Um, but that loss of electricity, you know, really compounded the issues that, that people in the Hawke's Bay had as a result of the devastation from that cyclone. So they really showed just how important electricity is. This is what Albie said when asked the same question. Well, that question assumes a model of growth and expansion is followed. To quote David Attenborough, anyone who thinks you can have infinite growth in a finite environment is either a madman or an economist. So, you know, I'd have to say that, you know, we wouldn't be interested in expansion. An inverter-based resource is a method of electricity generation that has to be converted from a DC or direct current input to an AC or alternating current for use in homes. An example of this inverter-based resource would be solar as it produces an DC output, but wind can also come under that blanket as it is not a traditional way of creating power like coal is. When I asked Nathan whether he thought inverter-based resources were the key to grid expansion, he said that hydro was at its limit in New Zealand and that wind and solar was the way forward. Look, obviously, look, we're talking about um, you know, wind, wind and solar here and also bat, you know, grid scale batteries, and these are the key part to the future electricity grid. I mean, renewable gen generation is, is essential. Our hydro is pretty much tapped out of New Zealand. I don't think there's any proposals for new, significant new hydro. Um, so you know, I think we are going to see a lot more inverter-based resources in the system, making the system. And as we discussed earlier, you know, there that can be integrated successfully. I then asked Nathan if he thought that supply chain problems would hinder our ability to scale the grid. And he said, I don't think it will be a problem as the whole world is decarbonising and with high demand comes big investment. Now, there's, it's not just New Zealand that's decarbonising, it's happening around the world. Um, and electrification is happening around the world. Uh, there is a huge demand for resources, for financing, for skilled staff as well. So these are all things that we're aware of. Um, you know, supply chain is something that we we look into years ahead, um, planning for our needs years and years ahead. Um, we we expect 
you know, the, with with demand, there's going to be investment in producing these materials. Um, the, but there is there is competition. We do need to plan. We we can't just um, you know expect that we can order something one day and it's going to be there. Um, but you know, I don't see supply chain issues holding up the um, the required sort of infrastructure and investment that we need to do. When asked the same question, Albie said that mining got us into this hole and we need to limit our conspicuous consumption. Well, mining has got us into this hole. It's unlikely to get us out. Um, we must cut our coat according to our cloth, really. You know, the world has to come to realise that there is pain. We will need to wind back our conspicuous consumption of the last 200 years. Thank you for listening and mā te